to the Slow Money Club podcast, the show giving you realistic ways of attaining financial freedom. We share get rich slow strategies to help you go from employee to entrepreneur and turn your dreams into income streams. Now here's your host, Kwesi. Hello and welcome to the Slow Money Club. I am delighted to be joined by the wonderful John Corey. For those of you who don't know John, he's one of the most experienced and knowledgeable people within the property space here in London. Although he doesn't come from London, he comes from much further afield and has properties all over the place, but he's been investing for a long time. He had a long career within the banking sector, and I think that would be relevant to a lot of people out there who have careers but want to make that transition from their current career into entrepreneurship. And on that note, I'm delighted to welcome John Corey to the show. Hello, John. Good day. How are you? Oh, I'm very well. And all the better for speaking with you, of course. Of course, of course. So and we should probably clarify with the audience that they will hear an authentic American accent. Which is not always a bad thing, as long as your name isn't Donald Trump. <laughs> well, we won't go there. I wasn't a supporter. <laughs> um, I don't, yeah, I don't think a lot of people who are American but not in America are supporters. So Most people in America who are in America weren't supporters. This is true, too. You didn't win the popular vote. Very true. Just to get us started, John, um, why don't you tell us a little bit just about you and your background and how you got from America to our shores? So uh, a few things. First of all, uh, my background is probably more technology than banking, and my banking experience relates to that. Um, so while you said I had a long background in banking, it's probably a much longer one in technology. And that starts back when I graduated with a degree in computer science focus on operating systems, and I went off to work for Eula Packard in Silicon Valley, and it all sort of started there. Um, you, I can touch on a couple of things just because it might be something people would be curious about. So I was one of the authors at HP of the Unix product called HP UX, which got them into the Unix business. I left there after eight years, um, and by the way, I worked on the Cupertino site that more recently has turned into the Apple Park. So I was there in a, a different period. Anyway, I moved from there to what was called Next, um, which was a computer company started by Steve Jobs after he was kicked out of Apple. And then only later did uh, Next realize that we had a company in the UK called Next, which happens to be a clothing retailer. So we changed the name to Next Computer trying to avoid the name conflict. Um, by the way, funny enough, uh, that's the second time Steve's gotten in trouble in effect with name conflicts because Apple was also a British registered name. Uh, it's the Beatles recording label. So the Apple computer and Apple, the uh, music industry uh, company, had their work on some settlements to get things to make, uh, make it so it wouldn't be a conflict. So after next, uh, the next major milestone um, was moving to one of the largest customers of Next Computer, which is when I switched uh, continents, moved to Europe, uh, which I had friends here in England say, well, this isn't Europe, this is England. And it's like, well, come on. Um, and I joined Swiss Bank Corporation. So the oldest of the three big Swiss banks at the time over a series of mergers and acquisitions where Swiss Bank was taking over various firms. They eventually took over UBS or technically Union Bank of Switzerland and then rebranded the joint uh, entity UBS. So today's UBS, I was part of one side of it. Um, worked at Egg, did a little bit of work at Royal Library, did some work at Dresdner, Clamart Benson, uh, Merrill Lynch, so some other financial firms. And that whole time from my arrival in Silicon Valley within a year or two is when I started my property investing career. So these days I say I'm a multinational landlord, which means two countries, uh, with property from Bradford to Hawaii. Nice. That's quite a difference, Bradford and Hawaii. <laughs> it is. <laughs> a lot of what you said, we're going to come back and try and unpick in a bit more detail. But how did you make that transition from Hawaii to Bradford? Um, so there's a theme and some of these things. I enjoyed my career and was in uh, the tech sector or banking sector for quite a long time. 
And most of the time I was buying properties that I had somehow a connection to the location, whether I had uh, visited it for holidays, whether I had lived there, uh, or maybe a banking friend um, knew of an opportunity. That's the Bradford one where I knew some uh, people, particularly a person at Egg, who was also a property investor, and he had some opportunities in Bradford, uh, Hawaii. I traveled there a number of times, and then there was a, a new project that was being offered. They had taken 25 years to get planning permission, and it's waterfront in Maui, so that was an opportunity to secure something there. Um, I would say that one's probably more of a personal, emotional decision than it was a pure uh, investment decision where Bradford was just based on the numbers. Um, most of the time, I'm pretty logical, but at the same time, all of us are more emotional and we use logic to justify things. Yep, that's very true. Psychology of decision making. Yes. There's a great book by um, Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow, which goes into a lot of the kind of research aspect of how we make decisions and the emotion versus making the decision and then rationalizing it, making an emotional decision and then rationalizing it afterwards, etc. So yeah, interesting. I want to just go back a bit to kind of the early part of your career that you mentioned. You you dropped a name in there, Steve. And I'm, I think you're talking about Steve Jobs. Yeah, actually, um, that's correct. Uh, sorry about that. So I joined Next, ended up taking on the IBM project that was not exactly what I interviewed for, but it was well within my skill set. And because of that, I had a dotted line to Steve and a dotted line to the head of uh, software development at Next and my direct boss in the developer support group. So then my direct boss chooses to step down. The, the VP of marketing and sales, which is where the group was sort of falls under, also left the company. So then Steve was uh, now my direct reporting line boss, and that was probably for about a year uh, because with the IBM project and then the direct reporting line, I ended up having to um, spend time with Steve. I wouldn't say – one of the jokes is the best place to be when Steve's in town – this is the field organization would say this – is anywhere else. <laughs> uh, he, and that was because he was mercurial. If I could say the word. Yep. Yeah, that one. Um, the issue wasn't so much bad person as much as super picky about things that some of us would like, oh, my God, does this really matter? And he's the boss, so it matters. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did learn, though, is, you know, presentation matters, how to tell a story, how to um, envision the future and then communicate that effectively in words. It wasn't just Steve. It was more the whole organization, um, which you could argue is maybe because of him. Uh, so it was a it was a good experience for me overall. Definitely learned a bunch of things about how to uh, communicate the future. Uh, another thing, random thing that came out of that was there was a summer intern that IBM hired on the project that I was co-leading. And got to know Eric, and over the years, Eric did a few things. I brought him into Swiss Bank for some temporary work. Uh, flew him in in the snow. I mean, we're recording this, and it's snowing out. And when I um, uh, flew Eric in, it was snowing in Zurich when I met him at the airport. But um, he would later go on to co-found LinkedIn. So I was a uh, beta tester because he called up and said, you know, we need some help with beta testing. Would you mind? I was happy to do so. And to continue the tangent, because sometimes you never know how these things will play out. Um, Eric was on the phone once during a feedback session. He had another LinkedIn employee with him. They were asking about my thoughts and other things. And I said, you know, I have all this computer science and AI study at Stanford, HP, Next, all this other stuff. That's my CV or resume. And But I want to also talk to people who invest in real estate. And they said, oh, we don't do talking. You're not supposed to talk to people online and LinkedIn. This is not a good thing. So I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll create a group over on um, Yahoo. We'll have LinkedIn employees act as the moderators and hosts for the group. And anybody that wants to talk and go over there. They don't have. They don't do this talking thing on our platform. Uh, now, this was very early days in LinkedIn. Uh, as we now know, so, you know, letting the users contribute content is the magic sauce 
uh, on Facebook and all these other things. Uh, but at that time, Facebook was tiny. LinkedIn wasn't doing any sort of groups or alumni stuff. So therefore, user contributed content wasn't the focus. And the world changes sometimes when you you make decisions that like, well, miss that one. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting if you look at LinkedIn now versus what you're describing. So what was the original idea? What did they actually think it was going to be if it wasn't going to be where employees and staff and people came to talk about work? Um, it wasn't at all meant to be that. It was meant to be where VCs and employers could um, tap into great talent. And the way you did this is everybody was a trusted introduction. So I could only uh, communicate with people that I knew and were directly connected to. Uh, correction, it's not directly connected to. At the time, you could go six layers deep. Now it's only three. But you did have to have an introduction. Uh, there was no in-mail at the time. It was literally you had to physically um, get permission, in effect, to connect. And it was... Um, very much the it was the dot com era, so LinkedIn was saying that the best companies and VCs are struggling to find the best talent and you tended to depend on each other and you know, who do you know they could do this and who's really good at that? And this was a way of making that work a bit better. Recruiters also, by the way, were completely banned from LinkedIn at the time. There was no way they were gonna let any recruiters on uh at that at that point. They made a mistake by changing that rule because all I ever get on LinkedIn are recruiters trying to tell me that I need a new job. That may be your profile and that may be how you manage your LinkedIn account because I don't tend to see that. Now, whether it's because of my profile is different and I'm not seen as a target. Um, but it was one of the things LinkedIn had to switch to was how to get to profitability. And they had these recruiters pounding on the door trying to give them money. And they finally figured out, you know, wow, if we just treat them like customers and accept their funds and we set some rules and boundaries, and this could actually be a viable business. And clearly it was, because Microsoft bought them for a good few billion, I think. Yeah, they did. They did. And one of the things as, you know, we're talking about entrepreneurs here, is you need to adjust, you need to pivot, you need to test things, the MVP type idea. And most of the time, your initial ideas don't actually play out very well. Or even if your idea is perfectly correct, like I would say some of the things that Next did were truly way ahead of their time the problem is if the market's not ready then you could die an ugly death before the market ever discovers it yeah um now just another little tangent because it might be fun for the listeners so there's a guy named bill at the time he uses the name william at this time now he's a little bit uh, more aligned with his full name and he was the final person to interview me in my process, so I get hired. It's 88, last month or two of 88, going into 89. And the product has been launched in October, a month before I got there, and we start shipping in the spring. Now, at some point after that or near that, there's a guy named Tim who wants to use uh, this cool software development environment called Next Step. Well, it works out, Bill is the uh, founder of that, that he had done a deal with Steve when he said, look, Steve, the stuff we've got is crap. I can do a better job. So they agree a 90-day uh, opportunity for William to go off and come up with his stuff. Uh, William does. It gets branded as Next Step, which is the development environment. Uh, it happens, by the way, to be the development environment of the core of it is what is still on the iPhone, iPad, Mac, uh, Coca, whatever you want to call it these days, the, the Next Step. Development environment is still there, and you can see the system calls. So anyway, Tim's boss says, fine, I'll buy you a next machine. We'll call it a, a demo unit, test unit. You know, there's new technology. That's our job here at, at the organization that they work for to test things. So let's get one in. But for this PO, I need to put down something. What are you going to do with it so that we can get signed off? And Tim says, tell you what, I'll do something for the physicists so they can get their research papers published quicker than waiting for the normal cycle. Um, it's going to be hypertext based. So Tim's boss gets it signed off. They get a machine delivered. It's um, a Next Cube, which is the first product line from Next. Tim works up this software. And then uh, we would now know him as Sir Tim Berners-Lee 
we're talking about node one on the web. The project to justify buying a next was basically inventing the web. And you can go to the Science Museum in London to see the actual next cube that was node one. And it was all because he wanted to use William software. Tim went on to invent the internet. Well, no, no, no. Tim used the internet, but he invented the web. Okay. And this next machine is node one. It is the original web server. Right. How interesting. So he was, and he invented the web as justification for buying a computer so he could get access to William software. And all because he wanted that software, he ended up inventing the World Wide Web. Exactly. So a lot of things in when you're an entrepreneur, you do it for one reason, and it turns out to be something else that was important or that you are a success. LinkedIn example, this example with inventing the web to get access to William Software, uh, William Software being the core product that actually attracted uh, Apple along with the basic operating system to buy Next, which is how we get OS X, iPhones, iPads. Yeah. And so what does William do now? Um, he's retired, um, as far as I know. Um, he lives in the U.S. He's done well. He had done well before he ever joined Next, and he did quite well at Next. And then he also spent a number of years working for Microsoft, trying to help them um, basically invent the future. Not so sure that they took it on board, but you know, their loss is our gain. Clearly. I guess I want to touch on this, the places you worked and there you were an employee, uh, albeit a very enterprising employee with access to a lot of entrepreneurial minded people. How did you make that transition from being an employee to being a full time entrepreneur as you are now? I would argue that my transition was a lot more subtle. Um, so I am a real estate investor these days and I have a portfolio of properties and I occasionally advise uh, other uh, individuals on their either property investing or on their um, tech ventures. I'm looking at a company right now that is innovating uh, in the technology meets property space. So it's not quite prop tech. It's more property than it is tech. Uh, it's more about reinventing living or co-living, co-working, that type of air environment. And... I would just say that I graduated in computer science back in 82, and pretty much my whole career has been about looking at problems and solving problems and seeing things differently. And you don't always, that sentence maybe confuses people. You don't actually see the future. You just see around the corner and you try things and you see what takes off and what works and shoot the ones that don't work and run with the ones that do work. Um, you get blindsided by stuff that's like after the fact, you're like, how did I miss it? It's so obvious. But then at the time, it wasn't obvious at all. So I've been on projects that turned into national bestseller books. Um, didn't know it at the time, but, you know, can place it in the book now. Um, and the, the pattern is that you, you incrementally solve problems. You get used to looking at things differently. Maybe my learning disabilities as a child help because you can't quite conform in the standard thought processes or educational processes. So you have to figure out how you're going to survive, even if the main path that most people would use is not open to you. Um, so it's a messy process. I like to use the analogy. And I was speaking to someone recently. I said, it's sort of like, on the plate, a cooked sausage might look quite fine, but in the factory, it's quite a messy process and you probably don't want to go watch if you're going to enjoy the sausage. So when it comes to experimentation, a lot of experiments are not super positive outcomes, but you learn from them and you learn quite a bit from your mistakes. And they're not really mistakes. It's more like the marketing people. It's test, test, test rather than fail, fail, fail. Uh, so focus on testing as a positive rather than it's a sign of a mistake. And that's a good point. So effectively, what you're saying is treating your failures as as tests, as negative test results, if anything, and just using those learnings to improve the next iteration and to do things better next time. Exactly. You, you can course correct and uh, make things work better, um, but you, you actually have to get moving and make some motion and It'd be nice if you could at least head in the right direction, but when you don't even know what direction right is, uh, that's a problem. A little um, tidbit. So one of the people I worked um, with at Next, and I help hire actually, uh, is Randy Nelson. And Randy does um, 
a number of different things. He was one of the founders of the Flying Car Mazov Brothers. They were in the Jewel of the Nile, the movie. They were an improv group. I remember actually first seeing them as a training film in HR, Human Resources, at HP. I only met Randy years after that, uh, seeing that training film. But Randy founded Pixar University, and he so he worked in X, and he worked at Pixar. And he did an eight and a half, nine minute recording as uh, it was a recording of him presenting at Apple to uh, Edutopia, which is a educational foundation, George Lucas funds. And Edutopia's talk that Randy delivered was how does Pixar hire people to invent the future? So he actually talks about the profile of people and how they think and what they do. And there's a, a number of messages there because it's not about looking for people that have a certain characteristic. It's almost about how to develop those characteristics in yourself. One of the ones he talks about is um, being curious about a lot of different things. And at the same time, knowing how to go deep and being top of the world in something, even if in the reference he uses skateboarding, world best, world's best skateboarder. He also talks about that you don't know where things are going to go. So rather than shut them down, you need to let them run, which is an improv technique. And it, he opens up the recording. So if you want to find that recording, it's a video um, recording. Look for Randy Nelson Pixar. Three words. There's only one that's going to come up. It runs about nine minutes. Perfect. And we will link to that in the show notes for sure. So our listeners can find that easily. But that's that's really interesting. I want to see that now. And Randy, you said Randy's someone, another one that you hired and... He went on to found Pixar. Steve said, here's a guy that he knew from a past corporate event, and he thought he was a good guy. So could we interview him and see if there's a role for him? So Randy ended up leading some of the next uh, developer training. And then when he switched to Pixar, the founder of Pixar, um, uh, Cantel, he, um, was, he asked Randy if he could create some sort of learning environment or something like that, which became Pixar University so that they could help grow and develop the employees at the head of Pixar. Interesting. Okay, so I want to pivot a bit. We've spoken a lot about your past and your background and how you got to Bradford from Hawaii, but I want to talk a little bit more about what you do now. So I know from experience that you host one of the best property networking events in the country. In fact, I can tell you that it's the only property event I've attended more than once over about two years and there are a lot of property cool. events which i've been i didn't to. know that yours is the only one i've been to more than once so that gives you access i guess to a lot of different people coming through your doors and who are doing different things employing different strategies and they're on their own journey to financial freedom what can you tell us about some of the stuff that people are working on these days especially for somebody who's new into property where should they be focusing their attention because there's a lot of distractions and a lot of shiny pennies out there so what would you recommend in terms of everything you see holistically would you say they should focus on well a few general principles um and you can use this almost as a way of evaluating any new shiny penny and some of the shiny pennies are shiny for a good reason and some are shiny just because they've never been used before and they'll lose their shine very quickly um one of the things is you have to remember that property investing real estate investing is maybe the more generic term, is relatively uh, capital intensive. It is not um, going to be very good at producing an income until you tie up a lot of capital. And the way to think of this is if you could get a 5% net yield or 5% income after expenses, so that means 5% that you could actually spend on your personal lifestyle rather than having to feed it to the business, you need 20 times that worth of equity or 20 times that in terms of assets in property. So it's for a lot of capital was soaked up to produce that income. Now, the positive is you can do a lot of things with real estate and adding value, taking a one bedroom, turning into two bedroom, taking an old derelict building and turning into a brand new skyscraper and everything in between so that you can create that equity that you need to produce that income. Um, you could also just wait a certain amount of time. Fundamentally, it is the central bank's job to make sure that the currency becomes worth less each year. This is called 2% inflation target. 
it's not a bad thing and it's not a negative thing about central banks and what they're supposed to do. I'm just saying that if you know that the currency is going to fall in its value every year by a certain amount and you hold assets that tend to be positive for inflation, um, meaning they're a good hedge for inflation, real estate being one of those. So those assets will go up in value if for no reason than the um, currency has gone down in value because you measure the value of property or real estate by the currency. That shouldn't be confused with, though, if you buy property in locations where there's a lack of demand. So say Detroit. Right now, Detroit has, say, 600,000 people that live there. At its peak, it had basically 2 million, and that was in the 1950s. So every year, Detroit needs fewer houses because there are fewer people living there. That's not a very good supply versus demand equation. So if you stick to markets where there's positive economics, people have jobs, people want to live there, they're not moving out, they're moving in, then you'll also get supply versus demand pressure, which will cause an increase in values if the supply can't keep up. If you have a currency that keeps going down over time, that currency will be worth less and less. So then the property will actually be, it'll take more of those less and less valuable banknotes. Um, so that's the basic backdrop. Then there's lots and lots of strategies. Rarely are they new. They may be, quote, secrets to you because you don't know them, but they're not secrets in that no one knows. Can't be a secret if they're willing to uh, sell you a course that'll teach you the secrets. <laughs> so, so then you should do what I say is start with what are you good at? If you're a numbers person or you love customer service type stuff, that should heavily influence the strategies that you choose to invest in property. Everybody has lived in houses or flats or whatever in the past. You have some core competence when it comes to what they look like, how they function. You might know what uh, you and your friends like when it comes to where you like to live, and commute distances. These are all things that can actually help you make better choices. Um, another big rule of thumb is don't get emotionally attached. These are not properties you're necessarily going to live in. So you want to buy properties that there is a demand for. And if a lot of people are not like you, you're the oddball, then buy properties that they want to live in, not ones that you want to live in. Um, don't over-personalize it. Don't become too attached to it. If it, uh, one thing my wife taught me is a lot of women are not, um, comfortable living on the ground floor. They want to be at least one floor above the ground level for safety. So if you're buying a ground floor flat, that might actually reduce the number of people you could rent it to. So that's a bad investment. So start with what you're good at. Take the long view, um, with the appreciation that it takes a lot of capital to generate an income. You can manufacture that capital through your day job or through actually doing property deals, buying and selling or buying and adding value. Time will also help. And then try to use strategies that play to your strengths and then build your knowledge base from there so that you're building from strengths rather than you keep diving into stuff you have no idea about and keep sort of paying a heavy price for that. That's very good feedback. I know that there's a lot of material out there in the public domain that talk about going, becoming full-time, quitting your job in the next few months and becoming a full-time property investor literally overnight. But what do you think about that? Do you think that's possible? I think it's rather lame. Um, lenders, particularly after the credit crunch, lenders don't want to lend to people who don't have an income um, because taxpayers don't want to bail out the banks. So more and more, they want to see that you have a stable income or they want to see it three-year track record on your tax returns. And whether this is U.S. or U.K., both countries sort of have that attitude about prove to us that you're credible for credit. Um, so you go and quit your job, you're switching sectors, you don't have a track record in the new sector, you don't have multiple years of tax returns that you can back up your claim that you can make money in this new sector. So now you're shut off from capital. Alternatively, you do the sort of entrepreneur thing where you have a day job and then you hustle your little whatever off on uh, nights and weekends to make things work during and but with you know with smartphones you can do so much now surreptitiously at your desk you know answer a text message or something make phone calls during a break or during lunchtime you don't need to like quit your job just to be a property investor and i think it's quite uh, immature to do that um, a lot of the property strategies are quite passive uh, most of the time you get a property up and running tenant moves in treat them well 
don't necessarily raise the rent and they could be there for years. That's it's not going to take much of your time. You'll be bored uh, if you've quit your job just to be a landlord. Um, the other thing you can do is this is new to the UK. It's relatively well established, but it's still in the early stages. You can actually invest in different deals through crowdfunding and get exposure to different strategies or different possible partners because you're buying shares in a company. And by this, I don't mean crowdfunding where you're lending money to borrowers. That's not going to help you learn a lot. I'm talking about crowdfunding that you're actually buying shares in a special purpose vehicle, which is nothing more than a limited company. That company has a sole purpose of owning an asset, turning into something else, improving it, renting out, whatever the strategy is. You get to sit at your desk, look at each of the deals, look at the numbers, figure out how many other investors maybe have already invested in it, how much they're raising. So instead of spending tons of money on courses and then having to get started, you're literally started after you have purchased your share in that company. And you can buy one share, you can buy 10 shares, you can buy more. This is an easy way to ease into different strategies and see who's doing what and what works and why it works. And you can invest in different markets if you wanted to. Um, there's positives and negatives to diversification versus concentration. I think that's a very good strategy. And a lot of people in uh, beginning to invest won't be aware of the crowdfunding approach, especially how you can use that to begin to learn about property investing. And actually, in a future episode, we will have John back um, to talk in more detail about crowdfunding when we do our crowdfunding series and look at how investors can use that strategy to begin. Thank you for bringing that up, actually. But we won't talk too much about that on this episode. What I do want to do, John, before I let you go, is just ask you some fairly quick fire questions um, and some short answers, if you don't mind. What was the biggest barrier you faced when you began investing? It's fairly chunky financially. So deposit or down payment plus loan, um, you know, these bigger numbers. How did you overcome that? Uh, first deal was just you do the normal process. Uh, second, it happened to be something I moved into. So the residential loan opportunity. Second deal, I brought in a joint venture partner. Um, that was 30-something years ago. Um, these days, you can do that different ways with crowdfunding. But uh, you, you, if you get good at finding deals, you'll run out of money, which means you'll run out of the equity you need to get a loan. Uh, so then the opportunity is to work with others and to be careful about the FCA regulations, but you can work with others legally. What is one tool or resource on your mobile phone, maybe, that you find invaluable and couldn't live without? I'm old school, so I use the HP 12C calculator. It's a financial calculator they don't even make anymore. Um, but it lets me calculate, calculate the repayments and other things very quickly. Funny enough, I have one that I keep um, from when I was doing my CFA. And you're right, they don't make them anymore. Final question for you, John. If, you, if somebody was beginning their investment today, so we spoke a lot about your background, but obviously things have changed over time. What would you say that somebody starting today needs to do differently to what you did when you were starting? The big difference these days is you can do a lot more um, research and information gathering online. I'm not saying that all online sources are sufficient. You still need to meet people. You might need to take some courses, but you can get a lot of information um, in the form of digital books and other things and online forums where you can tap into the collective wisdom of others. That's perfect. And actually, before I let you go, you mentioned books. Is there any book that you'd recommend to our listeners? There's no one book right now because it keeps evolving. Uh, a lot of the property game actually is about mindset. So in some respects, the bigger issues are getting your head around that you can do this. And there's some classic books out there, Think and Grow Rich and others, which are all about mindset. And I'm sure you actually know a number in that uh, space. And ironically, the book I'm reading right now is by Carol Dweck and it's called Mindset. There you go. I would recommend that book. She's a, a psychologist and a professor. Well, as always, it's been a pleasure. We, we always have a lot to talk about and we didn't even get to talk about blockchain or m many of the other stuff that we normally talk about in our conversation. So we'll certainly be having you back. We'll be speaking in detail about crowdfunding and how people can use that to begin their careers in investing. But I want to thank you for being our first guest on the Slow Money Club. And we we'll look forward to hearing from you again, John. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like more information on what you just heard, go to slowmoneyclub.com and join the club. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whichever app you use. And please also give us a five-star review. That way, you get the latest episode on your phone as soon as it's released. 
you also help other people discover this podcast too. Thanks for listening and see you next time on the Slow Money Club.